It's time now for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. History was made this week with cameras allowed into a UK court. The first televised case at London's Old Bailey Central Criminal Court saw J Sarah, uh, Judge Sarah Monroe jail Ben Oliver for life with a minimum jail term of more than 10 years after he admitted in January to killing his grandfather. But with a backlog of cases, shorter sentences and many criminals walking away scot-free, is British justice broken? And will cameras in court really improve justice in this country? In just a moment, I'll debate this with former Minister of State for Prisons and Shadow Home Secretary Anne Widdicombe, former lawyer and current UKIP leader Neil Hamilton and top defence lawyer Jade Gambrill. But first, I caught up with US lawyer to the stars, Michael Jackson and Winona Ryder's former lawyer, Mark Geragos, who told me how things work in America. The, uh, basically, the only courts that are televised are state courts. The federal courts do not televise trials, which is one of the reasons you didn't see um, Ghislaine Maxwell's trial, because that was in the federal court. The U.S. Supreme Court, which is a federal court, does audio stream meaning oh, that you can't see it, but you can hear it, the uh, proceedings in the U.S. Supreme Court. But other than that, it's only at the state level, as of right now, where we televise trials. Fascinating guy, one of America's most famous lawyers. I also asked him what having cameras in courts has actually achieved. I have argued for many years that the U.S. has imported from the U.K., a kind of a tabloidization, if you will, of the criminal law. Well, the, one of the things that we did not import from the UK was your Contempt of Court Act, which basically has is a counterbalance to doing the massive publicity that you get normally in criminal cases. Obviously, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard was an exception. That wasn't criminal, although by the time it was done, I almost felt like it was a criminal case. Uh, the the fact remains that one of the problems is it offers transparency. It offers presumably, at least in theory, a educational vehicle for the public. But on the downside, it's very difficult to get a fair trial. Uh, and there is a kind of a gladiator aspect to, to it. Now, don't forget that this legal veteran is the man who defended Michael Jackson. Tough gig. I asked him about whether televising trials cheapens the whole system and possibly contributes to a higher crime rate. Here's what he had to say. A lot of people who've made the argument, and I think there's a compelling uh, nature to it, that part of the school shooting problem is, is that you find predominantly it's white males of a very young age and that the publicity attended to it ends up um, kind of attracting that. I don't know that I buy into all of that, but yes, it does cheapen the system in a lot of ways. People get a, what I think is a skewed view of what lawyering or judging is all about. But I think I would be more judicious, uh, pun intended, in the use of which cases get televised. But when you have, generally, the televised trials are what I have affectionately or not so affectionately called the supersized trials. It's difficult enough to get a fair trial in a case that has that much attention. Then you throw, you know, this gasoline on the fire, so to speak, it makes it even more difficult. It's, it operates the same way as the Internet does. Uh, you know, you get online clicks. So what, what what is trying to be done is maximize eyeballs. It's one of the reasons you don't see a whole lot of televised probate cases or unlawful eviction uh, cases. I think that all the added attention makes it more difficult generally for famous or celebrity people to get fair trials infamous people, people who are known for their notoriety, it works in the opposite way. You didn't see his other hand. He was wearing Michael Jackson's white glove. Now, to discuss this further, I'm delighted to welcome top defence lawyer Jade Gambrill, leader of UKIP and former barrister Neil Hamilton and former prisons minister and former shadow home secretary Anne Widdicombe. Jade Gambrill, let me start with you. Is it appropriate to bring cameras into the courtroom? Does it not risk turning our court system into another part of showbiz? 
it absolutely does risk that. Uh, as far as I can see, this is the criminal justice system, not Love Island. Um, we, we're dealing with the darkest, most traumatic moment of people's lives, and it's not for entertainment. Um, it, it sort of has the feel of the modern day public stocks in the village square, where instead of throwing rotten fruit, we're throwing tweets. Um, and it certainly does have the feel of cheapening justice uh, to use it in that way. Also, does it not engender a more vengeful, vengeful society that's focused on the sentence rather than rehabilitation? It would certainly seem that way. Um, and it, it, it also at the moment seems, quite frankly, like a cheap trick to distract from an otherwise crumbling system uh, and instead to throw the blame at the sentencing judge rather than at what's really wrong with the system. However, uh, Jade Gambrell, watching uh, criminals go down, being sentenced, uh, is that not a, a, a deterrent, perhaps? You know, other, other people criminally minded watching uh, the consequences of crime and might think twice? Not at all. I couldn't see that at all. Um, those people would have to also be be, be watching uh, these sentencing remarks for one. And as, as far as I can see, even those yesterday uh, were taken into sound bites and some outlets or, or online. We were seeing sound bites and not the full remarks. So we really weren't getting the full picture of the judge's very methodical approach to that sentencing, which was highly complex and highly technical. And you've mentioned, Jade Gambrell, that our justice system is crumbling. Um, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Just, just where do the problems lie? Is it a backlog of cases? Uh, that's certainly one of the parts of the problem. It's, it's catastrophically, chronically underfunded at all levels. So we're talking police, we're talking courts, we're talking Crown Prosecution Service and defence practitioners. It's chronically underfunded and, frankly, it's quite quite fortunate if we are going to film sentencing remarks, we only see the judge because if you panned round, you'd probably see the bucket catching the drips and the mould on the walls. Uh, it's The waiting times are horrendous. We're waiting years for potentially a charge. We're then waiting years for a case to get to trial and it does not seem to be coming down. Uh, there seems at the moment it's just under 60,000 cases in the backlog. Um, I, understand the government ambition is to bring that down to 53,000 by 2025, which frankly doesn't seem very ambitious at all. Uh, we also have practitioners leaving in their droves, so lawyers leaving, because it's financially unsustainable to stay. And if there is no one to defend, the case doesn't proceed. Uh, I know, uh, Jade Gambrell, that when, when Kenneth Clark was Justice Secretary, he presided over 40% cuts during the uh, coalition government uh, between 2010 and 2015, and I think uh, I think it was uh, yeah, it was 40 percent cut to, to their uh, to their budget. So clearly, there's a legacy of underfunding. Uh, why does all of this matter to my viewers? There's a huge legacy of underfunding, but it's right up to the present day. I've got to say. Um, and it needs an injection, and it needs it now. Uh, it's important to viewers because any one of us, even us sitting here, anyone at all could find themselves in a courtroom or the subject of an allegation or wrongfully accused of a matter and requires representation. They need equality of arms and they need to be able to feel that they can present a fair case and also receive a fair trial. And at the moment, I don't see that happening. Uh, at the coalface, we're seeing colleagues and friends leaving in vast numbers, and they just won't be here anymore when you need them. Uh, it's, it's quite scary, frankly. Uh, Neil Hamilton, you're a former lawyer, also a former Conservative MP and now leader of UKIP. This does sound like a crisis of the Tories making. After all, they've been in power for 12 years now. Well, there is certainly a crisis in court funding. And I don't know why any newly qualified barrister would seek a career at the criminal bar, frankly, because the earnings are so uh, nugatory. I mean, the average young criminal barrister in their 20s probably takes home a maximum of 20,000 a year. And uh, without the kind of um, add-ons that you get when you're employed, by uh, you know, a company, as a member of the bar, you're a sole practitioner and self-employed. So you have to meet all your expenses 
yourself. I think this has been building up for many, many years, and, and not in, uh, simply under Conservative or uh, the coalition government. It's been building up uh, for, for, for decades. So something will have to be done about it because, as has just been said, eventually there will be no, or, or certainly not enough, defence lawyers available uh, for justice to be done to those who are accused. Um, but uh, you know, going back to the question which started all this about televising judgments, I don't really think there's uh, much that can be said against that. I think it's a very good thing, and I'm all for openness and transparency. You know, we sat through in the Supreme Court hearings over the various cases that Gina Miller uh, and others raised. We sat through the entire proceedings uh, which were televised, and I think that was very, very useful for public information to see the arguments deployed. Uh, it wasn't exactly gripping television because the, the pace of progress in the higher courts on points of legal argument tends to be glacial rather than anything dramatic. Uh, a criminal trial could, of course, be very different. Um, and different arguments, I think, apply in, in criminal cases. But I, I don't myself see any real objection to civil cases, appropriately civil cases, be, being uh, televised. It's a matter for the courts themselves to, and the judge to, to decide. Uh, it, it can't happen uh, below the Court of Appeal. So this is not something which is possible at the moment. And the innovation that we've just seen is just the televising of the delivery of the judgment, which would otherwise just be handed down in printed form and then published in the newspapers. I think it's a good thing that we, we, the, the, the public sees more of what goes on inside a court. Um, and I don't myself think that there's a great deal of danger of trivialization uh, or the kind of abuses which um, uh, we, we heard uh, talked about a, a moment ago. Um, it, the Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney case was a bit of a pantomime, I think, in most people's uh, opinion. And whether the, the public interest would have been served by televising that, I, I rather doubt. But, but um, there, there was undoubtedly great public interest in the case, and that's not necessarily the same as the public interest. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do think that it's important that justice should be uh, seen to be done, and the justice system should be seen uh, as it works, uh, and, and whether for good or ill. You could make the same argument as used to be uh, made of course, uh, against televising Parliament. Uh, that's only something which has come about in my life whilst I was a member of Parliament. In fact, that decision w w was taken, because the, the argument against that was that it would trivialise proceedings. Um, well, it hasn't turned out to be like that, has it? Uh, all you see now is acres of empty green benches uh, normally. Uh, but um, you know, it does show you the reality of what happens in the Chamber of the House of Commons. And uh, I think courts uh, are, are much the same. I think that in, in general, it would be a good thing for the public to see more of what, what happens inside the courtroom. Well, yes, uh, Neil Hamilton, the great revelation about cameras in Parliament is uh, we all discovered how incredibly photogenic you are. <laughs> yes, but I'm a lot older now and decrepit. Uh, and uh, you know, I got to the stage now where bits of my body are packing up or falling off. Except your brain, which is why you're still leader of a, a national political party, Neil. Uh, Anne Widdicombe, uh, does this not shine a light on how our justice system works and therefore educates the populace? No, I don't think that at all. I'm with Jay on this one. I think there are all manner uh, of dangers inherent uh, in televising court proceedings. Now, I think, you know, that if it is one or two very big constitutional cases which you're looking at, that is one thing. But we all know about mission creep. Uh, it happened with televising Parliament. When we first started televising Parliament, you couldn't do anything more than focus on the person who was speaking. You weren't allowed to record reactions or anything like that. Uh, and now, of course, it's it's completely different. And so nothing ever stays still. Things move. And what worries me about uh, televising court proceedings is um, excerpts and prejudicial comment. Now, I watched the American televising of the trial um, of the man accused of killing George Floyd. And what did you have immediately after each day's trial? You had pundits discussing, was this a prosecution day? Was this a defence day? Who won today? Now, you know, what is across the pond today comes here tomorrow. 
Mm. Uh, and I don't want justice trivialised in that fashion. So um, on balance, uh, I'm, I'm completely against televising it. On the more important issue, which are delays, and that's much more important, there are delays at every stage. It's, it's not just getting into court. The police take absolutely ages to process the case. Then the CPS have to decide whether they're going to prosecute or not. That takes ages. Then it's got to be listed. That takes ages. And then, of course, you have the unexpected holdups. I mean, I was involved in a trial uh, in March. Uh, and first of all, a couple of uh, um, the jury got COVID. And we had to suspend. We all came back. And then the judge got COVID and we had to suspend again. Uh, now, OK, COVID isn't going to be with us forever, but there are always reasons, you know, barristers are ill, whatever it might be, that trials get postponed. And so when we're talking about delays to the justice system, we mustn't just focus on the courts. You need to start right back at the police end. This is where justice starts. And frankly, it is not justice if you have to wait two years for your case to be heard, regardless of whether you're innocent or guilty. And finally... Um, when we talk about televising, I'm a columnist and I am quite rightly prevented under the sub judice laws um, from making selective comments um, when I'm uh, uh, writing my column. Uh, and I think you will get, if you get selected things being shown on television in the news, say they select a bit, um, they won't show the whole thing, uh, that could equally be prejudicial. Fascinating conversation. My sincere thanks to top defence lawyer Jade Gambrill, also the leader of UKIP and former barrister Neil Hamilton and former prisons minister Anne Widdicombe.